Hello viewers, I am Dr. Rubiul. I teach pathology in a medical college hospital and I am making this video for my students and also for you. Hope someone finds this helpful. Today's topic is Introduction to Hematology. In this lecture, we will learn what do we mean by hematopoiesis, what are the normal sites of hematopoiesis, and since bone marrow has a very important role in hematopoiesis, so we will also talk about the fascinating bone marrow microenvironment. We will also talk about hematopoietic stem cells. Okay, a lot of topics, so let's begin. So, we will start by talking about some introductory points. Recall from your physiology classes, we already know that the average human possesses about 5 liters of blood. We also know that this blood is composed of formed elements or blood cells and a liquid portion that is known as plasma. And formed elements or blood cells are of three categories. So what are the three categories of blood cells? We already know this. They are the red blood cells or erythrocytes, white blood cells or leukocytes, and platelets which are also known as thrombocytes. And in fact, hematology is the study of these cells. So what do we mean by the term hematopoiesis? It is defined as the physiologic process of formation of blood cells. So always remember hematopoiesis, it means formation of blood cells. It is the physiologic process of formation of blood cells. Now, one thing you have to remember Hematopoiesis is not occurring in only one location. As we will see, throughout our development, hematopoiesis is occurring in various locations according to the stage of our development. So we can also classify hematopoiesis in various stages. The first stage is known as mesoblastic stage, and during this stage, hematopoiesis is occurring in yolk sac. The next stage is known as hepatic stage and during this stage hematopoiesis is occurring mainly in the liver and also partly in the spleen. And the last stage is known as myeloid stage and as the name implies during this stage hematopoiesis is occurring in the bone marrow. So the point I'm trying to make here is that formation of blood cell is occurring in various locations and that's why we can classify hematopoiesis in various stages. Now before continuing further I will also like to show you another image. Now this is also an image that is summarizing the locations of hematopoiesis and as we can see initially hematopoiesis was occurring in yolk sac then liver and spleen and ultimately bone marrow became the site of hematopoiesis. Now, can you notice something? There is overlapping between these sites. And that's why I am showing you this image that although hematopoiesis is occurring in various locations during the various stages of our development, but there is also overlapping between the stages. For example, when yolk sac came to the end of its blood cell formation, liver and spleen during that time they became active and also we can see when liver is coming to end of its hematopoiesis stage bone marrow has already began forming blood cells so the thing to take from this image you don't have to memorize this image but you need to know that hematopoiesis is occurring in various sites and there are considerable overlaps between these various sites as we will see so, what are the sites of hematopoiesis? We have already discussed about this thing, and now let's talk about these sites in details. So, during the first few weeks of gestation, yolk sac, this is the transient site of hematopoiesis. Now, why am I mentioning this as transient site? Because after a few weeks, blood cell formation will stop in yolk sac. And also remember, not all types of blood cells are formed in the yolk sac. Mainly embryonic red cells are produced in this location. So this first appears 
during third week of embryonic development and the duration of this stage which recall I had mentioned as mesoblastic stage the duration is from third week to eighth week of intrauterine life. Now the last line is also very interesting. Yolk sac is also the source of long-lived tissue macrophages for example microglial cells that are located in the nervous system and also copper cell that are located in the liver. These are some long-lived tissue macrophages and yolk sac is also the source of these tissue macrophages. So yolk sac is not only making blood cells, it is also responsible for making these long-lived tissue macrophages like microglial cells and Kupfer cells. Now what is happening after several weeks? Mesoderm of intraembryonic aorta gonad mesonephros region, this becomes the definitive site of hematopoiesis. And in these locations, hematopoietic stem cells or hemangioblasts appear. And later, as we will see, these stem cells will migrate to the liver. So from six weeks until six to seven months of fetal life, the liver and spleen are the major hematopoietic sites and they continue to produce blood cells until about two weeks after birth. Now the last line is also very important here. Now what is the importance of this sentence? Why are we talking about fetal placenta and hematopoietic stem cells that are also taking residence in those fetal placenta? The importance is we can harvest hematopoietic stem cells at a birth from umbilical cord blood and that can be used for transplantation or other medical treatment. So always remember, although fetal placenta, it is not playing an important role in hematopoiesis, only a small amount of stem cells are migrating to the fetal placenta. However, they are a good source to harvest hematopoietic stem cells to use those stem cells in the future. So after four months of gestation, bone marrow becomes the major site and hematopoietic stem cells migrate to the bone marrow and the bone marrow becomes fully active or we can say that hematopoiesis inside the bone marrow becomes fully active by seventh and eighth months of gestation and by birth bone marrow becomes the major site of hematopoiesis. Now in the bone marrow always remember in younger age the whole skeletal bone marrow participates in hematopoiesis. In infants, all the bone marrow is hematopoietic. And as we will see, bone marrow essentially of all bones produce red blood cells until a child is about five years old. And later there is progressive fatty replacement of the bone marrow. So the hematopoietic stem cells are getting replaced by fat. And what is happening after puberty, hematopoiesis ceases in distal bones and becomes restricted to axial skeleton and also in proximal ends of some long bones. So the examples are very important. What are the sites of hematopoiesis after puberty? Always remember they will include axial skeleton like sternum, ribs, skull, iliac bones, vertebra, and also proximal ends of some long bones like femur, tibia, and humerus. Now, one thing you have to know, even in these hematopoietic sites, not the entire bone marrow is making blood cells. Approximately 50% of the bone marrow in these bones, they are made up of fat as well. However, fatty marrow is capable of reversion to hematopoiesis when required. Now, recall I had said after birth, bone marrow is the exclusive site of hematopoiesis. Well, this sentence is mostly true. However, there is one exception, and that is regarding lymphocyte production. Always remember, lymphocyte production continues to occur in the thymus, lymph nodes, and spleen, in addition to bone marrow in the adult life. Now, in your exam, you will often hear these two terms, red marrow and yellow marrow. So what do we mean by red marrow? It contains hematopoietic tissue and therefore it is red in appearance. Total volume is 1 to 2 liter. Yellow marrow, this contains predominantly fatty tissue and total volume is also 1 to 2 liter. And yellow marrow, in fact, serves as a reserve space so that during the time of need, hematopoietic tissue can expand. 
So the function of yellow marrow is it serves as a reserve space for expansion of hematopoietic tissue. Now, one term you will also hear in your exam is regarding extra medullary hematopoiesis. Spleen and liver can also resume their hematopoietic role in certain pathologic conditions. Recall that spleen and liver, they had role in hematopoiesis during our fetal life. However, after birth, they do not form blood cells and blood cells are produced in the bone marrow. However, if spleen and liver resumes their hematopoietic function after birth in certain pathologic conditions, that is known as extramedullary hematopoiesis. So now that we have talked about hematopoiesis, now let's move on and talk about the fascinating bone marrow microenvironment. It is a unique microenvironment and it is composed of networks of sinusoids as we will see. Now sinusoids are thin walled vessels and they are lined by single layer of endothelial cells. Now you may be asking me, Dr. Robil, capillaries are also lined by single layer of endothelial cells. So what is the basic difference? Always remember, basement membrane in case of capillary is continuous. However, the basement membrane of sinusoids are discontinuous. That is the main difference between sinusoids and capillary. As we will see, the interstitium or the space between the sinusoids will contain clusters of hematopoietic cells and fat cells. So here is a simple diagrammatic image of the bone marrow microenvironment. On the top we can see the bony trabeculae or the spongy bone. Beneath that we can see fat cells. Recall that fat cells have their nucleus pushed in the periphery by accumulation of lipid inside the cytoplasm. So it is very easy to notice a fat cell, a mature fat cell, by noticing the nucleus that has been pushed in the periphery. We can also see lymphoid follicles here. We can also see macrophages, hematopoietic cells, and in the center we can also see a cell that is called adventitial reticular cell. Now what is the importance of this cell? the reticulin fibers that this cell is creating, those provide supportive framework to the bone marrow. So now let's talk about hematopoietic stem cells. Now they can self-renew by asymmetric cell division. This line is very important. We can see that hematopoietic stem cells can self-renew, but that is achieved by asymmetric cell division. Now what do we mean by this term, asymmetric cell division? It means from one cell we are getting two daughter cells, however they will have different fate. One daughter cell will be exactly like the original hematopoietic stem cell. So that daughter cell is in fact a self-renewed cell. However, the other daughter cell will have a different fate. It will go into the differentiation pathway to give rise to some mature cells. So that is known as asymmetric cell division. From one cell we will get two daughter cells, however they will have different fate. Now also remember hematopoietic stem cells are also called pluripotent or multipotent and that is because they have potential to differentiate into many types of blood cells and they can be identified by co-expression of CD34 and CD45. Now, hematopoietic stem cells give rise to precursors of various blood cell series and also to cells of the immune system. And here we can see the steps in hematopoiesis. From the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells, we will get committed stem cells. And from that, we will get morphologically recognizable precursors. And from those precursors, ultimately, mature blood cells will be formed. So this concludes our first lecture of the introduction to hematology topic. So I hope this lecture was helpful. If you like my videos, do comment, share, subscribe and let me know. And for my students, I will also recommend you to go through your textbooks. I will upload the second part of this topic soon. Until next time, take care and stay blessed. Thank you.